A little cloud. Eight years before he had seen his friend off at the north wall and wished him God's speed. Gallagher had got on. You could tell that at once by his travelled air, his well-cut tweed suit, and fearless accent. Few fellows had talents like his, and fewer still could remain unspoiled by such success. Gallagher's heart was in the right place, and he had deserved to win. It was something to have a friend like that. Little Chandler's thoughts ever since lunchtime had been of his meeting with Gallagher, of Gallagher's invitation, and of the great city, London, where Gallagher lived. He was called Little Chandler because, though he was but slightly under the average stature, he gave one the idea of being a little man. His hands were white and small, his frame was fragile, his voice was quiet, and his manners were refined. He took the greatest care of his fair silken hair and moustache, and used perfume discreetly on his handkerchief. The half-moons of his nails were perfect, and when he smiled you caught a glimpse of a row of childish white teeth. As he sat at his desk in the King's Inns he thought what changes those eight years had brought. The friend whom he had known under a shabby and necessitous guise had become a brilliant figure on the London press. He turned often from his tiresome writing to gaze out of the office window. The glow of a late autumn sunset covered the grass plots and walks. It cast a shower of kindly golden dust on the untidy nurses and decrepit old men who drowsed on the benches. It flickered upon all the moving figures, on the children who ran screaming along the gravel paths, and on everyone who passed through the gardens. He watched the scene and thought of life and, as always happened when he thought of life, he became sad. A gentle melancholy took possession of him. He felt how useless it was to struggle against fortune, this being the burden of wisdom which the ages had bequeathed to him. He remembered the books of poetry upon his shelves at home. He had bought them in his bachelor days, and many an evening, as he sat in the little room off the hall, he had been tempted to take one down from the bookshelf and read out something to his wife. But shyness had always held him back, and so the books had remained on their shelves. At times he repeated lines to himself, and this consoled him. When his hour had struck he stood up and took leave of his desk and of his fellow clerks punctiliously. He emerged from under the feudal arch of the King's Inns, a neat modest figure, and walked swiftly down Henrietta Street. The golden sunset was waning and the air had grown sharp. A horde of grimy children populated the street. They stood or ran in the roadway, or crawled up the steps before the gaping doors, or squatted like mice upon the thresholds. Little Chandler gave them no thought. He picked his way deftly through all that minute vermin-like life and under the shadow of the gaunt spectral mansions in which the old nobility of Dublin had roistered. No memory of the past touched him for his mind was full of a present joy. He had never been in Corliss's, but he knew the value of the name. He knew that people went there after the theatre to eat oysters and drink liqueurs, and he had heard that the waiters there spoke French and German. Walking swiftly by at night he had seen cabs drawn up before the door and richly dressed ladies escorted by cavaliers alight and enter quickly. They wore noisy dresses and many wraps. Their faces were powdered, and they caught up their dresses when they touched earth like alarmed Atalantis. He had always passed without turning his head to look. It was his habit to walk swiftly in the street, even by day, and whenever he found himself in the city late at night he hurried on his way apprehensively and excitedly. Sometimes, however, he courted the causes of his fear. He chose the darkest and narrowest streets, and, as he walked boldly forward, the silence that was spread about his footsteps troubled him, the wandering silent figures troubled him, and at times a sound of low fugitive laughter made him tremble like a leaf. He turned to the right towards Capel Street. Ignatius Gallagher on the London press, who would have thought it possible eight years before? Still, now that he reviewed the past, little Chandler could remember many signs of future greatness in his friend. People used to say that Ignatius Gallagher was wild. Of course, he did mix with a rakish set of fellows at that time, drank freely and borrowed money on all sides. 
In the end he had got mixed up in some shady affair, some money transaction. At least that was one version of his flight. But nobody denied him talent. There was always a certain something in Ignatius Gallagher that impressed you in spite of yourself. Even when he was out at elbows and at his wit's end for money he kept up a bold face. Little Chandler remembered, and the remembrance brought a slight flush of pride to his cheek, one of Ignatius Gallagher's sayings when he was in a tight corner. "'Half time now, boys,' he used to say light-heartedly. "'Where's my considerin' cap?' That was Ignatius Gallagher all out, and damn it, you couldn't but admire him for it. Little Chandler quickened his pace. For the first time in his life he felt himself superior to the people he passed. For the first time his soul revolted against the dull inelegance of Capel Street. There was no doubt about it. If you wanted to succeed you had to go away. You could do nothing in Dublin. As he crossed Grattan Bridge he looked down the river towards the lower quays and pitied the poor stunted houses. They seemed to him a band of tramps huddled together along the river banks, their old coats covered with dust and soot, stupefied by the panorama of sunset and waiting for the first chill of night bid them arise, shake themselves, and be gone. He wondered whether he could write a poem to express his idea. Perhaps Gallagher might be able to get it into some London paper for him. Could he write something original? He was not sure what idea he wished to express, but the thought that a poetic moment had touched him took life within him like an infant hope. He stepped onward bravely. Every step brought him nearer to London farther from his own sober inartistic life. A light began to tremble on the horizon of his mind. He was not so old, thirty-two. His temperament might be said to be just at the point of maturity. There were so many different moods and impressions that he wished to express in verse. He felt them within him. He tried to weigh his soul to see if it was a poet's soul. Melancholy was the dominant note of his temperament, he thought but it was a melancholy tempered by recurrences of faith and resignation and simple joy. If he could give expression to it in a book of poems, perhaps men would listen. He would never be popular, he saw that. He could not sway the crowd, but he might appeal to a little circle of kindred minds. The English critics, perhaps, would recognize him as one of the Celtic school by reason of the melancholy tone of his poems. Besides that, he would put in allusions. He began to invent sentences and phrases from the notice which his book would get. Mr. Chandler has the gift of easy and graceful verse. Wistful sadness pervades these poems. The Celtic note. It was a pity his name was not more Irish-looking. Perhaps it would be better to insert his mother's name before the surname. Thomas Malone Chandler. Or better still, T. Malone Chandler. He would speak to Gallagher about it. He pursued his reverie so ardently that he passed his street and had to turn back. As he came near Corliss's his former agitation began to overmaster him and he halted before the door in indecision. Finally he opened the door and entered. The light and noise of the bar held him at the doorways for a few moments. He looked about him, but his sight was confused by the shining of many red and green wine glasses. The bar seemed to him to be full of people and he felt that the people were observing him curiously. He glanced quickly to right and left, frowning slightly to make his errand appear serious. But when his sight cleared a little he saw that nobody had turned to look at him. And there, sure enough, was Ignatius Gallagher leaning with his back against the counter and his feet planted far apart. "'Hello, Tommy, old hero. Here you are. What's it to be? What'll you have? I'm taking whisky. Better stuff than we get across the water. Soda, Lydia, no mineral. I'm the same. Spoils the flavour. Here, garçon, bring us two halves of malt whisky like a good fella. Well, and how have you been pulling along since I saw you last? Dear God, how old we're getting. Do you see any signs of ageing in me, eh? What? A little grey and thin at the top, what? Ignatius Gallagher took off his hat and displayed a large, closely cropped head. His face was heavy pale and clean-shaven. His eyes, which were of bluish slate colour, relieved his unhealthy pallor and shone out plainly above the vivid orange tie he wore. Between these rival features his lips appeared very long and shapeless and colourless. 
He bent his head and felt with two sympathetic fingers the thin hair at the crown. Little, little Chandler shook his head as a denial. Ignatius Gallagher put on his hat again. "'It pulled you down,' he said. "'Press life. Always hurry and scurry looking for a copy and sometimes not finding it. And then always have something new in your stuff. Damn proofs on printers, I say, for a few days. I'm just glad I can tell you to get back to the old country. Does a fella good, a bit of a holiday? I feel a ton better since I landed again in dear dirty Dublin. Here you are, Tommy. Walter, say when. Little Chandler allowed his whisky to be very much diluted. You don't know what's good for you, my boy, said Ignatius Gallagher. I drink mine neat. I drink very little as a rule, said little Chandler modestly. I nod half one or so when I meet any of the old crowd, that's all. Now, well, said Ignatius Gallagher cheerfully, here's to us and to old times and old acquaintance. They clinked glasses and drank the toast. I met some of the old gang today, said Ignatius Gallagher. O'Hara seems to be in a bad way. What's he doing? Nothing, said little Chandler. He's gone to the dogs. But Hogan has a good sit, hasn't he? Yes, he's in the Land Commission. I met him one night in London and he seemed to be very flush. Poor O'Hara. Booze, I suppose. Other things too, said little Chandler shortly. Ignatius Gallagher laughed. Tommy, he said, I see you haven't changed an atom. You're the very same serious person that used to lecture me on Sunday mornings when I had a sore head and a four on me tongue. You'd want to knock about a bit in the world. Have you ever been anywhere, even for a trip? I've been to the Isle of Man, said little Chandler. Ignatius Gallagher laughed. <laughs> the Isle of Man, he said. Go to London or Paris. Paris for choice. It'd do you good. Have you seen Paris? I should think I have. I've knocked about there a little. And is it really so beautiful as they say? asked little Chandler. He sipped a little of his drink while Ignatius Gallagher finished his boldly. Beautiful, said Ignatius Gallagher, pausing on the word and on the flavour of his drink. It's not so beautiful, you know. Of course, it is beautiful, but it's the life of Paris. That's the thing. Ah, there's no city like Paris for gaiety, movement, excitement. Little Chandler finished his whisky and, after some trouble, succeeded in catching the barman's eye. He ordered the same again. I've been to the Moulin Rouge, Ignatius Gallagher continued when the barman had removed their glasses, and I've been to all the Bohemian cafes. Hot stuff. Not for a pious chap like you, Tommy. Little Chandler said nothing until the barman returned with two glasses. Then he touched his friend's glass lightly and reciprocated the former toast. He was beginning to feel somewhat disillusioned. Gallagher's accent and way of expressing himself did not please him. There was something vulgar in his friend which he had not observed before. But perhaps it was only the result of living in London amid the bustle and competition of the press. The old personal charm was still there under this new gaudy manner. And, after all, Gallagher had lived. He had seen the world. Little Chandler looked at his friend enviously. Everything in Paris is gay, said Ignatius Gallagher. They believe in enjoying life. And don't you think they're right? If you want to enjoy yourself properly, you must go to Paris. And mind you, they've a great feeling for the Irish there. When they heard I was from Ireland, they were ready to eat me, man. Little Chandler took four or five sips from his glass. Tell me, he said, is it true that Paris is so immoral, as they say? Ignatius Gallagher made a Catholic gesture with his right arm. Every place is immoral, he said. Of course, you do find spicy bits in Paris. Go to one of the students' balls, for instance. That's lively, if you like, when the cocottes begin to let themselves loose. You know what they are, I suppose. I've heard of them, said little Chandler. Ignatius Gallagher drank off his whisky and shook his head. Ah, he said, you may say what you like. There's no woman like the Parisienne. For style, for go. Then it is an immoral city, said little Chandler with timid insistence. I mean, compared with London or Dublin. London, said Ignatius Gallagher. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. You ask Hogan, my boy. I showed him a bit about London when he was over there. He'd open your eye 
I say, Tommy, don't make punch of that whisky. Lick her up. No, really. Oh, come on, another one won't do you any harm. What is it? The same again, I suppose. Well, all right. Francois, the same again. Will you smoke, Tommy? Ignatius Gallagher produced his cigar case. The two friends lit their cigars and puffed at them in silence until their drinks were served. I'll tell you my opinion, said Ignatius Gallagher, emerging after some time from the clouds of smoke in which he had taken refuge. It's a rum world. Talk of immorality. I've heard of cases. What I was saying, I've known them. Cases of immorality. Ignatius Gallagher puffed thoughtfully at a cigar, and then, in a calm historian's tone, he proceeded to sketch for his friends some pictures of the corruption which was rife abroad. He summarized the vices of many capitals, and seemed inclined to award the palm to Berlin. Some things he could not vouch for, his friends had told him, but of others he had had personal experience. He spared neither rank nor caste. He revealed many of the secrets of religious houses on the continent, and described some of the practices which were fashionable in high society, and ended by telling, with details, a story about an English duchess, a story which he knew to be true. Little Chandler was astonished. "'Ah, well,' said Ignatius Gallagher, "'here we are in old jog-along Dublin, where nothing is known of such things.' "'How dull you must find it,' said Little Chandler after all the other places you've seen." "'Well,' said Ignatius Gallagher, "'it's a relaxation to come over here, you know. And after all, it's the old country, as they say, isn't it? You can't help having a certain feeling for it. That's human nature. But tell me something about yourself. Hogan told me you had tasted the joys of connubial bliss. Two years ago, wasn't it?' Little Chandler blushed and smiled. "'Yes,' he said. I was married last May twelve months. "'I hope it's not too late in the day to offer my best wishes,' said Ignatius Gallagher. "'I didn't know your address, or I'd have done so at the time.' He extended his hand, which little Chandler took. "'Well, Tommy,' he said, "'I wish you and yours every joy in life, old chap, and tons of money, and may you never die till I shoot you. And that's the wish of a sincere friend, an old friend. You know that.' "'I know that.' said little Chandler. "'Any youngsters?' said Ignatius Gallagher. Little Chandler blushed again. "'We have one child,' he said. "'Son or daughter?' "'A little boy.' Ignatius Gallagher slapped his friend sonorously on the back. "'Bravo!' he said. "'I wouldn't doubt you, Tommy.' Little Chandler smiled, looked confusedly at his glass, and bit his lower lip with three childishly white front teeth. I hope you'll spend an evening with us, he said, before you go back. My wife will be delighted to meet you. We can have a little music and— Thanks awfully, old chap, said Ignatius Gallagher. I'm sorry we didn't meet earlier, but I must leave tomorrow night. Tonight, perhaps? I'm awfully sorry, old man. You see, I'm over here with another fella. Clever young chap he is, too, and we arranged to go to a little card party. Only for that. Oh, in that case— but who knows, said Ignatius Gallagher considerately, next year I may take a little skip over here now that I've broken the ice. It's only a pleasure deferred. Very well, said little Chandler. The next time you come we must have an evening together. That's agreed now, isn't it? Yes, that's agreed, said Ignatius Gallagher. Next year, if I come, paroled on oar. And to clinch the bargain, said little Chandler, we'll just have one more now. Ignatius Gallagher took out a large gold watch and looked at it. "'Is it to be the last?' he said. "'Because, you know, I have an A.P.' "'Oh, yes, positively,' said little Chandler. "'Very well, then,' said Ignatius Gallagher. "'Let us have another one as a juck on durus. "'That's good vernacular for a small whisky, I believe.' Little Chandler ordered the drinks. The blush which had risen to his face a few moments before was establishing itself. A trifle made him blush at any time, and now he felt warm and excited. Three small whiskies had gone to his head, and Gallagher's strong cigar had confused his mind, for he was a delicate and abstinent person. The adventure of meeting Gallagher after eight years, of finding himself with Gallagher in Corliss's surrounded by lights and noise, of listening to Gallagher's stories 
and of sharing for a brief space Gallagher's vagrant and triumphant life, upset the equipoise of his sensitive nature. He felt acutely the contrast between his own life and his friend's, and it seemed to him unjust. Gallagher was his inferior in birth and education. He was sure that he could do something better than his friend had ever done, or could ever do, something higher than mere tawdry journalism, if he only got the chance. What was it that stood in his way? His unfortunate timidity. He wished to vindicate himself in some way, to assert his manhood. He saw behind Gallagher's refusal of his invitation. Gallagher was only patronising him by his friendliness, just as he was patronising Ireland by his visit. The barman brought their drinks. Little Chandler pushed one glass towards his friend and took up the other boldly. Who knows, he said, as they lifted their glasses. When you come next year, I may have the pleasure of wishing long life and happiness to Mr. and Mrs. Ignatius Gallagher. Ignatius Gallagher, in the act of drinking, closed one eye expressively over the rim of his glass. When he had drunk, he smacked his lips decisively, set down his glass, and said, No bloomin' fear of that, me boy. I'm going to have my fling first, and see a bit of life and the world before I put my head in the sack, if I ever do. Some day you will, said little Chandler calmly. Ignatius Gallagher turned his orange tie and slate-blue eyes full upon his friend. You think so? he said. You'll put your head in the sack, repeated little Chandler stoutly. Like everyone else, if you can find the girl. He had slightly emphasised his tone, and he was aware that he had betrayed himself. But, though the colour had heightened in his cheek, he did not flinch from his friend's gaze. Ignatius Gallagher watched him for a few moments and then said, If ever it occurs, you may bet your bottom dollar there'll be no moonin' and spoonin' about it. I mean to marry money. She'll have a good fat account at the bank, or she won't do for me. Little Chandler shook his head. Why, man alive, said Ignatius Gallagher vehemently. Do you know what it is? I've only to say the word, and tomorrow I can have the woman and the cash. You don't believe it? <laughs> well, I know it. There are hundreds, what am I saying, thousands of rich Germans and Jews rotten with money, that it would only be too glad. You wait a while, me boy. See if I don't play my cards properly. When I go about a thing, I mean business. I tell you, you just wait. He tossed his glass to his mouth, finished his drink and laughed loudly. Then he looked thoughtfully before him and said in a calmer tone, But I'm in no hurry. I can wait. I don't fancy tying myself up to one woman, you know. He imitated with his mouth the act of tasting and made a wry face. Must get a bit stale, I should think, he said. Little Chandler sat in the room off the hall, holding a child in his arms. To save money they kept no servant, but Annie's young sister Monica came for an hour or so in the morning and an hour or so in the evening to help. But Monica had gone home long ago. It was a quarter to nine. Little Chandler had come home late for tea, and, moreover, he had forgotten to bring Annie home the parcel of coffee from Bewley's. Of course, she was in a bad humour and gave him short answers. She said she would do without any tea, but when it came near the time at which the shop at the corner closed, she decided to go out herself for a quarter pound of tea and two pounds of sugar. She put the sleeping child deftly in his arms and said, Here, don't waken him. A little lamp with a white china shade stood upon the table, and its light fell over a photograph which was enclosed in a frame of crumpled horn. It was Annie's photograph. Little Chandler looked at it, pausing at the thin, tight lips. She wore the pale blue summer blouse which he had brought her home as a present one Saturday. It had cost him ten and elevenpence. But what an agony of nervousness it had cost him! How he had suffered that day, waiting at the shop door until the shop was empty, standing at the counter and trying to appear at his ease, while the girl piled ladies' blouses before him, paying at the desk and forgetting to take up the odd penny of his change being called back by the cashier, and finally striving to hide his blushes as he left the shop by examining the parcel to see if it was securely tied. When he brought the blouse home, Annie kissed him and said it was very pretty and stylish. But when she heard the price, she threw the blouse on the table and said it was a regular swindle to charge ten and elevenpence for it. At first she wanted to take it back, 
but when she tried it on she was delighted with it, especially with the make of the sleeves, and kissed him and said he was very good to think of her. Ah! He looked coldly into the eyes of the, of the photograph, and they answered coldly. Certainly they were pretty, and the face itself was pretty, but he found something mean in it. Why was it so unconscious and ladylike? The composure of the eyes irritated him. They repelled him and defied him. There was no passion in them, no rapture. He thought of what Gallagher had said about rich Jewesses. Those dark oriental eyes, he thought. How full they are of passion, of voluptuous longing. Why had he married the eyes in the photograph? He caught himself up at the question and glanced nervously round the room. He found something mean in the pretty furniture which he had bought for his house on the hire system. Annie had chosen it herself and it reminded him of her. It was too prim and pretty. A dull resentment against his life awoke within him. Could he not escape from his little house? Was it too late for him to try to live bravely like Gallagher? Could he go to London? There was the furniture still to be paid for. If he could only write a book and get it published, that might open the way for him. A volume of Byron's poems lay before him on the table. He opened it cautiously with his left hand, lest he should waken the child, and began to read the first poem in the book. Hushed are the winds and still the evening gloom, not e'en a zephyr wanders through the grove, whilst I return to view my Margaret's tomb, and scatter flowers on the dust I love. He paused. He felt the rhythm of the verse about him in the room. How melancholy it was! Could he too write like that? Express the melancholy of his soul in verse? There were so many things he wanted to describe. His sensation of a few hours before on Grattan Bridge, for example. If he could get back again into that mood. The child awoke and began to cry. He turned from the page and tried to hush it, but it would not be hushed. He began to rock it to and fro in his arms, but its wailing cry grew keener. He rocked it faster while his eyes began to read the second stanza. Within this narrow cell reclines her clay, that clay where once it was useless, he couldn't read, he couldn't do anything. The wailing of the child pierced the drum of his ear. It was useless, useless. He was a prisoner for life. His arms trembled with anger and suddenly bending to the child's face he shouted, Stop! The child stopped for an instant, had a spasm of fright and began to scream. He jumped up from his chair and walked hastily up and down the room with the child in his arms. It began to sob piteously, losing its breath for four or five seconds, and then bursting out anew. The thin walls of the room echoed the sound. He tried to soothe it, but it sobbed more convulsively. He looked at the contracted and quivering face of the child and began to be alarmed. He counted seven sobs without a break between them and caught the child to his breast in fright. If it died... The door was burst open and a young woman ran in panting. "'What is it? What is it?' she cried. The child, hearing its mother's voice, broke out into a paroxysm of sobbing. "'It's nothing, Annie. It's nothing. It began to cry.' She flung her parcels on the floor and snatched the child from him. "'What have you done to him?' she cried, glaring into his face. Little Chandler sustained for one moment the gaze of her eyes, and his heart closed together as they met the hatred in them. He began to stammer. Eh, it's nothing. He, he began to cry. I couldn't. I didn't do anything. What? Giving no heed to him, she began to walk up and down the room, clasping the child tightly in her arms and murmuring, My little man, my little manny, was who frightened, love? There now, love, there now. Lamb of bon, mamma's little lamb of the world, there now. Little Chandler felt his cheeks suffused with shame and he stood back out of the lamplight. He listened while the paroxysm of the child's sobbing grew less and less, and tears of remorse started to his eyes.